Hey guys, Will here. So today's video is one that I've been excited to put together for quite some time now. As you can see in front of me, I have the SimMagic Alpha Mini, Alpha and Alpha U or Alpha Ultimate. What we're gonna be doing in today's video is cross comparing not only all three of these wheelbases against each other to help you guys decide which one of these might be most suited to your specific needs. We're also gonna be cross comparing all three of these guys against their competitors within the direct drive market. So a lot to get through today. We're gonna to try and get through it as quickly as we possibly can. So let's dive in. So as always, some quick housekeeping stuff just so you have the full context of exactly what we're doing today. So firstly, big thank you to SimMagic for sending across all of this gear for us to check out for the purposes of uh, this review and all the others that we'll be doing over the next couple of months. Now, I do want to quickly mention that we do have another video, which I would recommend you check out if you haven't already seen it, uh, going over the, the full SimMagic ecosystem. So looking at the shifters, their pedals and whatnot, we are going to be doing more specific reviews of each of those products, like what we're doing here in today's video, but definitely watch that video as a precursor to what we're going to be talking about today, because there will be some assumed knowledge in today's video just to try and keep things a little bit shorter. So a big thank you to them for sending this gear across to us. Now we will, as I mentioned, also be cross comparing against most competitor products in today's video as well. So it's important that you're aware that all of those products have all been provided to us under the exact same conditions. Now we do also have some affiliate links available down in the description box below, as well as some discount codes for most of the brands that we're gonna be talking about today. So regardless of what you might wanna pick up, if anything, that is an awesome way of helping support our work here at Booster Media without it costing you a cent. And we we do really appreciate your support there. So as is always the case here at Booster Media, we're not under any sort of obligation to say any specific things and everything we're gonna be covering in today's video is purely just my own observations and my own opinions, having been putting these through their paces for a very extended period of time now against all of their competitors as well. So let's dive in first of all, talking about pricing. Now I don't wanna get bogged down in pricing for today's video, but just to give you the quick rundown on all three of these guys here. So all the pricing we're discussing here has been taken off the SimMagic website the day that we're recording this video. So as is always the case with pricing, but particular with SimMagic, seeing as they've got such a well-established distribution network around the world, it does pay to shop around. Even though we do have that discount code down below, I would recommend shop around, make sure you're getting the best possible deal because you may be able to avoid uh, import duties and things like that if you buy from a local distributor. But to give you the pricing directly from the SimMagic website, Alpha Mini comes in at 539 US dollars at the time of recording this video. The standard Alpha comes in at 769 US dollars and the Alpha U comes in at $999. They just dropped the price of that from $1,029. So without getting completely bogged down in pricing here, that puts it at relative parity with an equivalent uh, strength base from Mozart. Comparing with Fanatec and their new club sport models, it's a little bit more complicated because they don't have a model that kind of matches equivalent strength directly. Their DD Plus is similar to the kind of strength that you feel in the standard Alpha. And their CSDD at 12 Newton meters holding sits somewhere between the Mini and the Alpha. You do of course need to factor in their ecosystem and the fact that they do have console compatibility natively as well. So that is an important consideration. And I would definitely recommend, you know, if, as is the case with all of these products we're comparing to, we do have specific reviews of all of these we can dive in and uh, really extract all the details about them that you might want if you're actually looking at buying any one of these so I would definitely recommend you do that and then comparing against Acetec Sim Sports similar kind of equivalent strength bases throughout their lineup as well and these Sim Magic bases do come in a little bit cheaper than those ones do and then comparing against SimuCube 2 their entry level sport is kind of more equivalent to the uh, to the alpha in this range so it's kind of like one step up but all of their bases are quite significantly more expensive than what we find within the SimMagic ecosystem. So that gives you a kind of base point for comparison. And again, check out our full detailed reviews of all of those products. We will be revisiting the uh, SimuCube ecosystem over the next few months as well. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on those videos. That's gonna be really exciting to go through all those again for you guys. So moving on from pricing now, I think the first thing that is important to consider here is the wider ecosystems. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we do have the full ecosystem overview video for SimMagic. And I would definitely, once again, recommend checking that out if you haven't already. But Look, to give you a, an understanding of why I'm placing so much weight on this overall ecosystem business is because, look, honestly, and you guys have heard me say this in a few videos recently, all of these modern direct drive wheelbases, whether it's SimMagic, uh, Moza, Acetec, SimuCube, Fanatec, even Camus now are pretty darn good as well. VRS is another one. All of those are providing a really fantastic force feedback quality these days. And I think what, what tends to happen is we, we maybe get caught in the trap of looking at the highest number that we can get in terms of peak strength for the lowest amount of money and kind of basing our decision primarily around that. What I really want to try and get, get across to you guys is that that 
perhaps isn't as important as it used to be. It's it's kind of, you know, we, we need to acknowledge that most people are gonna find that somewhere between the 10 and 15 Newton meter mark in terms of peak strength is more than likely gonna be strong enough for, for pretty much everybody, unless you've got a lot of upper body strength, unless you're a bodybuilder or something like that. So, you know, the, the reason I say that is because you never wanna be in a situation where the car is driving you rather than you driving the car. You always wanna be the one controlling the car. And, you know, I find that the majority of people I speak to that, that ends up falling somewhere between that 12 and 14 or 15 Newton meter mark. So what you really wanna do is zoom out and look at the wider ecosystem. What other hardware is available? What's the quality like uh, within each ecosystem and how much gear do they actually have available? And that was one of the reasons why if you saw my video at the end of last year uh, going through my top sim racing products for the year. Uh, I was pretty harsh on Logitech with their G Pro series simply because that wheelbase and their pedals are actually pretty good value and they provide a very good driving experience, but they don't have that wider ecosystem. They haven't expanded, they haven't offered new wheels, they haven't offered a, a pro line shifter or handbrake or anything like that. And I know that that's something that's really disappointing for those who have bought into that ecosystem on the expectation that they would have access to higher quality peripherals, but also for people that are looking at buying gear, they may be swayed towards those products for certain reasons, but then ultimately end up buying something else because they don't have the support of other accessories available within their ecosystem. So make sure you do your research there. Again, we have detailed review videos of pretty much everything available here on the channel. So you can see exactly what you're getting yourself into. But in the case of the Sim Magic stuff, as you saw in that previous video, they have a really, really solid ecosystem now. Uh, really, really impressed with it. Their shifters, their handbrakes, their pedals even, all very, very good. And their wheels are fantastic now too. The uh, We just reviewed the Neo wheel just recently, which is actually my pick for the best value wheel in sim racing at this point in time. Really, really fantastic quality for the price point. And you know, this is something that they've really, really nailed in terms of value for money within the Sim Magic ecosystem. So that is that is a very big strength for Sim Magic before you even start to get into the quality of the force feedback and whatnot. Now, if we compare against some of the other ecosystems, uh, Mozza do have a pretty extensive ecosystem these days. Um, what I would say there is their wheels just don't quite have the same quality feel that Sim Magic do. Now, Sim Magic wheels are maybe a touch more expensive than some of the Mozza ones are. So if you're really after, you know, the best bang for buck, then, you know, maybe you'll be absolutely fine with Mozza wheels. But again, check out our detailed reviews of all of those and you'll see for yourselves just some of those little things in terms of quality. I just feel like Sim Magic provides a more premium experience in terms of look and feel, you know, all, all those things that may or may not be important to you. Comparing against Fanatec then, they do do have a more extensive ecosystem, more wheels available. Uh, I would say that their shifter and their handbrake is nowhere near the quality of what's available within the Sim Magic ecosystem. They're a little bit last generation, maybe more than a little bit last generation, I would say, in terms of their handbrake and their shifter. Sim Magic definitely have the upper hand there, but Fanatec, of course, have a much larger selection of different wheels at various different price points. Now, it is worth noting there as well that Sim Magic don't lock out the force feedback, so you are free to use any wheel that you want, uh, and as long as you've got a, as long as you get an NRG style quick release and some way of connecting that wheel to your PC, you are free to do that on Sim Magic without the need for any expensive adapters. Fanatec, on the other hand, do lock out force feedback, so if you're not using an emulator from a third party or one of their hubs, whether it be the Universal Hub or the Podium Hub, uh, you will have that additional cost. So that is definitely something that's worth considering. And again, definitely an, an advantage to looking at some of these other ecosystems, including Sim Magic. But they do have a more extensive native ecosystem than Sim Magic does at this point in time. Having said that, Sim Magic have expanded a lot over the last couple of years. I have to, I have to keep remembering back that it was only you know four or five years ago now that we reviewed the uh, Sim Magic M10, which was the only product they had, and we were really unimpressed with it at the time. Time. And you know they really have come a long way since then, which is really fantastic to see. More competition in the space is always a good thing. Uh, so that's Mozza and uh, and Fanatec kind of covered there. Again, check out the full detailed reviews for the entire breakdown of that. Talking about Acertech now, Acertech have come quite a long way in the last year. They are a much newer brand to sim racing than Sim Magic are. Force feedback quality aside, because we'll get into that later on, I would say that Sim Magic probably have an advantage in terms of their overall ecosystem at this point in time. We haven't seen a shifter or a handbrake from Acertech just yet. They have just released a new button box with a selection of different wheels. Check the video link down in the description below for the full breakdown of that. But not quite as an extensive ecosystem as what we find with Sim Magic at this point in time. And then comparing against SimiCube, they don't really have a lot to offer in terms of wider ecosystem. They don't have shifters, they don't have handbrakes. Uh, they do have pedals, but they're extremely 
extremely expensive uh, and they do have a small selection of wheels, which look for, in terms of value for money, I don't actually rate all that highly. They're good wheels for what they are, but really SimuCube is generally considered a more open ecosystem, although it isn't really any more open than any of these other products other than Fanatec. But you know, most people that are buying SimuCube bases are buying them with the expectation that they're not going to be buying a SimuCube wheel. They're most likely going to be buying, you know, Cube Controls, Asher, GSI, you know, one of those other brands. And again, we do have a massive library of dedicated wheel reviews, which you can check out right here on the channel as well. So to summarize that for you guys, I would say SimMagic are probably about on par with Moza at this point in time in terms of their ecosystem, maybe a little bit behind just in terms of the, um, the, the value for money prospect there, simply because although I rate SimMagic's gear higher than Mozza's for the same kind of price point, Mozza do have a larger selection of different peripherals at different price points. So they do have some cheaper pedals available, whereas SimMagic do seem to be focusing more on that kind of mid to high level uh, part of the market. Now, having said that, because these are PC compatible products, you can use whatever pedals and peripherals you want. So, you know, it's, it's only really a consideration if you want to stay within the one ecosystem. But I do really like what SimMagic have done in terms of having a wide variety of um, high quality sim racing gear that you can plug in. It all runs through the same software package and it's, it's just easy. It just works. And uh, yeah, they've done a really good job there. So that is ecosystem. Again, check out our full breakdown of the SimMagic ecosystem and the experience there if you're wanting more information on that. But that gives you an idea of where this sits compared to other products. What I want to do now is uh, get into the force feedback and the driving experience with these bases. So I want to start off by plugging this into a PC on the desk here and running you through some of the options that are available in terms of configuration with these wheelbases, what kind of tuning options are available and uh, how that relates back to the driving experience. And then we'll close that off and get right into the driving experience and comparisons. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the software now as it pertains to the wheelbase and driving experience specifically. Now, again, if if you check out our previous ecosystem overview video, we went through all the various different tabs and showed you what the wider software package looks like and how it all operates. Just to give you a super, super, super quick rundown here, you do have tabs across the bottom for all of their various peripherals. So you would click on each one of those individually to load up the settings pertaining to that particular device. We also have presets for various different games, settings, updates, uh, firmware flashing, all that stuff all built into the one software package. So the idea is that you can do everything you need to do all through the one software package. You don't have to have separate software like you do with Fanalab, for example, in Fanatec, or uh, SimuCube has separate software between their pedals and their wheelbases, for example, although I believe they will ultimately be bringing that together. As it stands right now with uh, Mozza, Acetec, VRS, uh, as of recently, and SimMagic, as you see here, uh, all integrated into one piece of software. So let's quickly run through the settings available for fine tuning the driving experience as it pertains to the wheelbase. Specifically, you can see I've got the Alpha U connected to the PC here. I've done that simply so that we have the maximum torque or dynamic range scalable all the way up to 23 Newton meters. If you had the Alpha connected, this slider would max out at 15 Newton meters and the Mini it would be 10. Everything else here in terms of adjustments is all exactly the same uh, between all three models. Now just quickly as a point of reference here as well, within the uh, SimuCube 2 ecosystem, uh, the Pro and the Sport have the same adjustments. The Ultimate actually has a couple of additional options, uh, which look honestly, I've never really felt a significant difference between tweaking those settings anyway, but just so you know, there are a couple of extra tweaks that you can make on a SimuCube 2 if you buy the ultimate. But let's run through these now. So you've got your angle adjustment here. One interesting thing is you'll see I've got a negative seven here on my uh, steering. Now I found when we were driving, and this was the same across all these wheelbases and has been every single time we've tested SimMagic products. Um, regardless of the PC that we have it installed on as well, I've probably tested it across five or six different PCs over the years. I always find that uh, it's a little bit awkward to calibrate the center. You calibrate the center to the exact center. And then when you jump into the game, it's always a little bit offset to the right by seven degrees. So what I've found is if I just tilt my steering seven degrees to the left or minus seven degrees and calibrate that as center, then inside the game, it seems to be correct. So I'm not sure, it's, it's always been the case. Not sure why that is still the case. Let us know in the comments down below if you've had that experience too. Maybe it's something I'm doing wrong. I don't know, but it's, as I said, it's always been the case across uh, everywhere that we've tested SimMagic bases. So interesting. But anyway, let's move on here. Now, all these other settings you'll notice, we've got these little question marks and they do have very well written tool tips for pretty much all of these now. So you can pop up and see exactly 
what it is that you're adjusting and the impact that that has on your uh, on your driving experience. So this is pretty uniform across most brands these days. Gives you a nice little explanation of what each of these settings does. But to give you the quick rundown here, angle, that is your sensitivity. So in the case of these wheelbases, it's adjustable between 90 degrees, not that you'd ever wanna go that low. Lowest most people would ever go is about 360 for F1 style cars, for example. Uh, you can wind this all the way up to 2,520 degrees for your truck sim style driving. We're gonna jump that back to 900 for now. Uh, we've got angle presets here as well, which you can manage. Uh, speaking of presets, actually, that is one thing that they've just recently added to this Sim Pro software is the ability to export and share your profiles, which is something we see in most other ecosystems these days. So great to see it here. We've got a hard lock angle here as well. So because direct drive wheelbases can mechanically spin infinitely, you can place a hard lock so you feel a bump stop when you reach the end of your uh, angle adjustment here. So you can see at the moment it's set to 900 to match our angle. If we increase that, you can see the scope of adjustment here increases as well. If we wind that up to 2520, you can see it goes up here too. So say for example, you wanted to have your sensitivity set to 2520, but you wanted to actually feel that mechanical bump stop at 900 degrees, you can do that. I don't really uh, know of any scenario where you would want to do that, but you can if you want to. Uh, we've got the strength of the hard limit as well. So again, because it's not a mechanical bump stop, you can adjust between a soft, a normal, or a firm feeling when you reach the end. I generally will run normal or firm because that's how it feels in most real life cars. You kind of hit that hard bump stop and the steering doesn't go any further. So moving across now into our force feedback settings. Up the top line here, we've got a adjustment for force feedback as well as maximum torque. Now, the maximum torque adjustment you can think of as a dynamic range adjustment. So what I would generally recommend doing here, and this is the case for any wheelbase, is setting this to the maximum amount of torque that you ever wanna feel through the steering, even in the event of like a massive crash or something like that. So when the wheel's going absolutely crazy, I generally limit this to around the sort of 15 Newton meter mark for most wheelbases, because that's the most amount of torque that I ever wanna have go through the wheel under any sort of scenario, including crashes. So what that's doing is it's actually limiting the dynamic range of the wheelbase to that 15 Newton meter mark. And then over on the left hand side here, you can see we've got our force feedback adjustment. This is the strength of the force feedback within that dynamic range. So you can imagine if you've got it set to say 23 Newton meters, you can use the full dynamic range of the motor. So it's gonna be able to produce any strength force feedback between zero and that 23 Newton meters. And then the force feedback adjustment here on the left hand side will reduce or scale the force feedback within that available dynamic range, if that makes sense. So generally, they recommend you have this set somewhere between, what do they say, 70 and 100%. I would generally recommend having this set to 100% and then reducing the force feedback inside the game if you are finding that you're running into clipping. Now, clipping is a bit of an interesting one. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we get into the driving experience. But basically, the argument for having more dynamic range or a stronger wheelbase is uh, generally the motors will have a little bit more responsiveness or a faster slew rate but also having that available dynamic range means that you can spike up to those really strong force feedback events like crashes without running into clipping. I would argue that for the majority of people, what the force feedback feels like in the event of a massive crash isn't overly important. As long as it's not clipping when you're running over ripple strips or wrestling the car through corners like a Rouge, for example, um, you know, as long as you're not clipping in those scenarios, it doesn't really matter. But again, let me know in the comments what you think of that, what's your experience been like. Now that's my recommendation in terms of these two settings. We then have an adjustment for smoothness. This is basically just filtering the signal that's coming out of the game. So in the uh, in the example of say, iRacing for example, which runs a lower force feedback frequency of 60 Hertz, you may find that you wanna run a little bit more smoothness here. We then move down into our vehicle setting. So wheel rotation speed, this is basically how responsive the wheel feels overall. So for things like drifting, you probably find you wanna to go to higher values depending on the car you're driving and the diameter of your wheel. You don't wanna go so far that the wheel just completely snaps. You want it to kind of match the rotation of the car. So as the car swings out, the wheel just kind of will naturally go to the position it wants. So you're gonna to need to fiddle around with that. For most sort of GT style driving, what do they have as their default settings? So if we go to a set of Corsa, for example, and revert to defaults, you can see they've got their real rotation speed actually set quite low there. Then force feedback detail, this enhances things like road textures, ripple strips, and whatnot, so you can fiddle around with that. I find that if I go too high on this, the force feedback does start to feel a little bit robotic, but we'll cover that when we get into driving experience in just a minute. They actually uh, mention here as well in their tool tip that a higher value may increase noise and heat while driving. We then move over onto our mechanical adjustments. There is a little tab here for other effects too. So we've got an adjustment here for mechanical spring. This is basically just an overarching force which forces the wheel to return 
turn to center. Generally more useful for sims that don't support force feedback. Most games that have force feedback support these days include some sort of a centering force anyway. So you're generally gonna find you're gonna have that set to zero most of the time. Center damper, pretty self-explanatory. You guys can see on the screen exactly what that does. And then we've got an inertia spring damper and friction setting that actually modify the signals coming out of the game. So these are like game filters, you could say, as opposed to driver and firmware level adjustments like what we see on the right hand side here. So we then have our maximum torque, we already talked about that, our mechanical damper setting. So adjust the amount of damping applied to the wheel as it rotates. Uh, this is a constant effect that adds smooth resistance to the wheel, which can help dampen sharp force feedback effects and give the wheel a richer feel. So it's kind of, it's, it's a bit of a balancing act here. And again, the value that you want to have here will depend on the sim and the car that you're driving, but it just gives that, uh, it gives that sensation along with friction and inertia of being mechanically connected to something inside the car rather than just being connected to an electric motor. One of the things you'll notice with sim magic motors is they don't have a lot of of, uh, rotating mass. So the motor shaft itself doesn't actually have a lot of natural inertia. Obviously you will add some inertia with the weight of the wheel connected to it, but having the adjustment here allows you to create that, uh, create that sensation in the absence of having it in real life. Similarly, friction does pretty much exactly what it says here, adds a little bit of friction. So the sensation of more weight behind the wheel. Inertia, Again, pretty self-explanatory here, gives the sensation of there being some weight that's sort of fighting against you as you stop rotating the wheel. So as you rotate the wheel, you feel the wheel kind of continuing to want to try and turn, which simulates being connected to, you know, big heavy wheels and tires, the contact patch on the road and whatnot. So. I actually tend to run these kinds of filters a little bit higher than a lot of other people do because I like to have a nice smooth and mechanically authentic feeling steering wheel, but that does come at the loss of detail pretty much across the board with any direct drive wheelbase. So it's very much a subjective thing. I do get criticized quite a bit for how high I tend to run these types of filters, but this is actually what you're seeing on the screen now is just their uh, default cooked in profile for Assetto Corsa. Uh, so that is inertia and then feedback frequency. What does it say about this? Symmetric zero latency force feedback upsampling algorithm converts low frequency force feedback signals into high quality signals. So it's basically an interpolation filter or a reconstruction filter as uh, similar to what we find across most high-end brands these days. So that is a quick rundown on the settings that you get in terms of force feedback adjustment. I would say pretty much on par in terms of useful stuff here to what you find from most major brands. As I mentioned, Simicube does have a little bit more that you can tweak here. Whether or not that's really useful in the, in the real world is kind of debatable. I found across all three of these wheelbases, I was able to dial this in within the limitations of the motor characteristics themselves to feel really quite authentic. So no real complaints there. And I like the fact that it's nice and approachable. There aren't a whole bunch of settings here that you know you have no idea what it means. If you're coming into this for the first time, I don't think that you're gonna be overwhelmed. You can kind of hover over each one of these and uh, you know see what's going on. There's plenty of community support as well in their Discord. People are sharing their profiles. Now that you have the ability to import them and share as well, that makes it a lot easier so you don't have to dial things in yourself copying screenshots and whatnot. And they do have a lot of cooked in profiles here as well for all the major titles, including things like BeamNG. And I was impressed to see that they've already got a profile here for uh, Le Mans Ultimate, both GTE and hybrid cars. So obviously they're on top of these things, which is really, really good to see. But let's move on from the software now and get into, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanical design of these compared to some of the competitors and then get into the driving experience. So let's quickly have a little chat about the physical hardware. And I mean, I think there's already a lot of things that people straight away will recognize and like about all three of these products. I love how clean and simple the design is, particularly, you know, when we look at things like the Turtle Beach wheelbase that we looked at just a couple of weeks ago, we posted a picture of the internals of that and you could see that it had a motor that looked similar to this, albeit a lot smaller um, internally. And a lot of people commented, why don't they just make it look like that and not have all this plastic shell around it? Even compared to say the Mozza R16 and 21 as well. I really like this nice clean design. I love the fact that these motors have nice, um, threads in the front here. And this of course just allows them to bolt into any SimuCube style front mount, which is really, really nice and clean. So nice and simple in that way. There's nothing at all here that doesn't need to be here. In terms of inputs and outputs as well, I like the fact that they've put them on the sides. So you've got your DC jack input here, your USB connection on the side. And then if we flip one of the bases around, you can see on the opposing side, we've got a CAN bus USB port, which we haven't, I believe, seen any use for just yet. But at some point in the future, I assume there'll be some sort of peripherals that they'll release that will make use of that. And all three 
models do also have a RJ jack here for their emergency stop button, which is a nice touch. A lot of other wheelbases, the more entry level models within their ecosystem emit that. So great that they include that. I do personally believe, and you guys have heard me say it on numerous videos now, an e-stop is an important thing on any direct drive wheelbase because if a small child gets caught up or something like that, or you get a tie or a piece of clothing mixed up in the wheel, or even a USB cable, it can cause unnecessary damage. Whereas if you have an e-stop button, you can just hit it quickly. And then we've got the quick release system, which again, we've covered extensively in that previous ecosystem overview. But just to give you the quick rundown on this, I think it's one of the best, if not the best, uh, OEM quick releases available within sim racing. Fanatec have caught up now with their QR2. The Acetec quick release is quite nice as well. Of course, Mozzie used the same style quick release as this as well. So it's an NRG style quick release, allows you to use any NRG style adapter for any third party wheel that you want. And it just has these additional pins inside which transmit power across. And the wheel connects to the wheelbase via a proprietary Bluetooth protocol. Now with the very early wheelbases from SimMagic like the M10 years ago, we did have a couple of communication issues. Happy to report I haven't had any issues at all across any of these three wheelbases with any of the SimMagic wheels that they sent us to check uh, at all. So plug it in, everything's just worked straight out of the box. No issues there whatsoever to speak of. We did have a couple of disconnection issues. I can't remember if that happened prior to the previous video. I may have mentioned it in that ecosystem overview video. If not, it must've been something that occurred slightly after. But uh, that said, with the more recent uh, firmware revisions and software revisions, that hasn't been an issue at all. So nice to see the improvements there too. And yeah, absolutely no discernible flex or slop or anything like that, no free play in any of the quick release combinations that we've tested. Obviously there's always a little bit of uh, mechanical tolerance in the machining, but with these ball bearings that pop into place here to hold everything in place, I haven't had any issues whatsoever to speak of. So absolutely no complaints there whatsoever. I think they've done a really, really good job. And probably, I think they're punching above their weight in terms of price point, in terms of the overall build quality and the presentation of all these products. And that goes for their wheels and their other peripherals as well. I really do feel like, you know, the, the, the quality that you're getting for your money and just the way it looks and feels in your hands, it really does look and feel like a premium product. In my opinion, every bit as good, at least at face value as the likes of SimiCube. So yeah, absolutely no complaints whatsoever in terms of the hardware. I think they've done a really, really good job. Let's move on now into the driving experience. Now I want to split this into talking about the comparison between these three wheelbases specifically, and then we'll unpack that a little bit further and talk about comparisons with some competitor products as well. So starting out with these three guys. Now I've, um, I've seen questioned quite a bit and questioned myself uh, exactly how these fall into the market in terms of both their overall strength and the slew rate of these motors or the responsiveness of these motors too. Now, I actually went to Tyler, who is uh, one of the owners, I believe, at SimMagic and asked him directly about both of those questions. Now, his response with regards to holding talk, and I'll read this out verbatim for you guys just so you have exactly what he said. He said, hey, Will, for us, holding talk and peak talk are industrial concepts. We are a motor custom built for sim racing. So we cannot explain using industrial concepts. Fair enough. Uh, we refer to it as maximum torque, and you'll see that in the specs on their website if you go onto any of these motors. And these principles apply to SimiCube and Acetec as well. So what he means by that is that every manufacturer is gonna have their own way of measuring peak torque or holding torque. And you know, if you look at Fanatec's recent marketing with their new CSDD and DD Plus bases, you'll see they included a graph which showed the amount of time that it could hold that maximum amount of torque and how it rolled off over time. Look, realistically, under real life driving scenarios, you're unlikely to ever actually reproduce a, uh, a scenario like that anyway. You're never gonna be holding full torque in a corner for more than a couple of seconds, even with oval racing. So other than just like driving around in circles on a skid pan, for example, I can't really think of another scenario where that would really come into play. So what he's saying there does make sense. I know some people will hear that and think that they're trying to hide something. I mean, maybe they are, I don't know, but some, what I can tell you is that all three of these bases, I feel like in terms of peak strength, do actually punch above their weight. I would say that the Alpha Mini, which they quote as 10 Newton meters, feels more similar to the 12 Newton meters that you get with the uh, with the CSDD, for example. The Alpha at its 15 Newton meters feels quite similar to the SimiCube 2 Sport and the DD Plus in terms of overall strength. And then the uh, Alpha U, that kind of sits out on its own a little bit. There's not really much else that sits around this kind of strength, maybe the VRS Direct 4 Pro, but look, the reality with the Alpha U is that it's far more strength than I think anybody's ever going to need. And uh, so it kind of becomes a bit of a moot point once you get up into those kinds of, those ranges above about that 15 Newton meter mark, at least in my opinion. So that's what they have to say about peak or uh, holding torque or strength. And then with regards to slew 
rate, my question to him was, uh, I'll read it to you exactly. I said, other question I had is, do you have the slew rates available for all three models, please? And his response was, as for slew rate, we haven't overly focused on this. And you'll notice in their literature, they never actually state a slew rate at all. Our focus is on balancing slew rate and inertia, just as lighter wheels can achieve more direct force feedback. And we were actually talking about that just before with regards to the, uh, the rotating mass of the motor shafts on these guys. So uh, then he goes on to say, in terms of the motor itself, inertia refers to the weight of the motor rotor. Uh, if you were to manually rotate the motor, you would noticeably feel that our rotor is lighter, which again is what we were just talking about. So uh, yeah, I, th I think that that's a okay answer. It's not really giving me the numbers that I was looking for, but I think it's a fair enough point. So the reason why I was asking about those slew rates specifically was because look, honestly, I can't feel a difference in responsiveness between any of these three designs, which actually really surprised me. I expected, that I might find that the overall driving experience and the sharpness that I felt with the uh, with the Alpha U may be a, a massive step above what it was with the Alpha and the Mini especially. So look, the reality was, um, and I think you probably can already tell where I'm going with this, if 10 newton meters of strength is enough for you, then the Mini is absolutely fine. If you feel like you need more than that, go with the Alpha. Honestly, I can't see many scenarios where somebody would need to go as far as having the Alpha U. As I was explaining before, it does have the uh, it does have the advantage of giving you more dynamic range. Look, I don't really feel like under any normal driving scenarios you need more than 15 newton meters of torque. It's only really going to be uh, you know under crash scenarios where you would experience higher levels than that. And you know, I come back to what I was saying earlier about not wanting to be in a situation where the car is driving you rather than you driving the car. We can crank the force feedback right up and uh, we might actually include a little clip of me driving around at, uh, at absolute 100% force feedback on the Alpha U here for you guys so you can see how much I'm struggling to just get the car around the track. Now, obviously somebody that's a lot stronger than me wouldn't be struggling as much as me, but the, the point is that, again, you wanna be driving the car rather than the car driving you and I feel like majority of people, that level is gonna fall somewhere between about 10 and 14, 15 newton meters. So I would say if you've got a similar build to me or smaller, then I would say you're probably not going to notice any significant benefit from spending the extra money on the Alpha U and you should probably go with the uh, with the Alpha. If you're a drifter that doesn't need strong force feedback or you just don't think you're going to need that additional strength, then the Mini is absolutely fine. In reality for me, when I was driving with the Mini, having just driven with the U and the Alpha, I did find that it was a little bit on the weak side for me. I was finding that I was running into clipping a little bit and I was having to turn the force feedback down a little bit further than I otherwise would. But that is coming from somebody that's used to running a Simi Cube 2 Ultimate on my rig every day. So I have the luxury of being able to produce those higher force feedback levels if I want them. The reality is if this was the first direct drive wheelbase that I'd ever owned, I would probably be absolutely okay with it and not feel any need to upgrade. The Mini is more likely to be something that you may want to upgrade from in the future, whereas I think if you were to buy an Alpha, it's probably going to be your life wheelbase. I think, I think you're probably never going to feel compelled to upgrade this unless something with new technology comes out that improves other aspects of the driving experience. And with regards to the U, I just don't really see any justification for it over this guy. Unless you've just got a huge amount of upper body strength, yeah, I just don't think that it's necessary. So that is the rundown on the three of those. My pick would be the Alpha for future proofness, but if your budget only extends as far as the Mini, I think you'll be absolutely fine with that as well. How does the driving experience compare against competitors? Now, look, I uh, spent I spent the better part of a week driving across all three of these models and then cross comparing against other wheelbases with their latest firmware and drivers, including the new 360 hertz update for the Simic 2 bases uh, in iRacing. So I did test that extensively as well. Look, testing all the stuff back to back, I think that these fall pretty cleanly into their price point within the market. So what I mean by that is that I think that the quality of the force feedback is maybe a little bit more refined, although we are talking about very fine margins here with the Acetec bases. A little bit more granular detail there, a little bit smoother overall. I found that effects with all three of these bases, and remembering again that they do feel similar, give or take the, uh, the peak strength that's available on all three. The driving experience here just felt a tiny little bit more robotic across the board, and that was regardless of how I tweaked the settings as well. Now, I'm not saying that the force feedback feels robotic overall. I don't think anybody's gonna have a problem with it. It is very smooth and refined overall, but when, you, when you're talking about those fine margins and the differences between different brands, I would say that uh, 
in my experience at least, you know, testing across all the various different sims and testing across all the models, Acer Tech did tend to feel just that little bit more refined, a little bit smoother and a little bit more authentic, but it is only a very, very small amount. Whether or not it's worth the extra money to you, all other things considered around ecosystem, everything that we discussed in this video uh, is really gonna be up to you. Let's, uh, let's go back the other way and compare to Mozza as well. Look, I find that Mozza wheelbases have fallen a little bit behind in terms of force feedback recently. You've heard me talk about this a few times recently. They've released quite a few software updates recently to try and fix various aspects. And I've always found that there's a little bit more filtering required within Mozza wheelbases to get that authentic and smooth feeling out of it. And in doing that, to create that overall smoothness that's kind of inherent in most of the other ecosystems, you do end up filtering out a lot of the granular detail that um, is present on other wheelbases. So there's a little bit more of a sacrifice or compromise uh, to achieve smoothness in terms of granular detail with the Mozza bases. Now, I don't think that it's a limitation of the hardware. I think it's just that their software and their firmware is maybe a little bit behind where their competitors are at this point. So like, I think if you were buying into the Mozza ecosystem, and ultimately it'll likely get there. But at this point in time, I would say that these products do provide a better driving experience than their Mozza counterparts. When you consider the physical design of these, the quality of their other peripherals as well, I do much prefer their P1000 pedals, which we'll be looking at in a separate video very soon. Uh, I do much prefer those to their CRP pedals or any of the other pedals that they offer in their ecosystem. They do have some cheaper options as we discussed earlier, but Look, I'm just not a big fan of any of the Mozza pedals that are currently available. I think that Simagic have done a much better job there. Their shifters and their handbrakes and other peripherals are a little bit better as well, although they are a bit more expensive. So you've got to factor that in to the equation as well. But without rambling on here, if I was choosing between Mozza and Simagic right now, I would definitely, absolutely, 100% unequivocally choose Simagic. So how do they compare with the Fanatec CS, DD and DD Plus? Now, look, it, it, it is difficult to really make a comparison here at this point in time. You probably already figured out what I'm going to say here. We don't have full force working on those Fanatec bases uh, at this point in time. So really can't say what they're potentially capable of. But what I would say is that at this point in time, I do feel like both the CSDD and the DD Plus have a little bit more refined, similar to what we were talking about with Acer Tech, a little bit more refined detail there. Not necessarily any smoother than these are, but very, very, very fine margins. It would be very, I think in a blind test, it would be very, very hard to pick between the two at this point in time, but we'll come back and we'll circle back to that and we'll talk about that a little bit more once we've got full force working a couple of games and we can compare them properly. So that is the situation with Fanatec at this point in time, at least compared to the uh, the CSDD and the DD+. Also just of course, consider their, the native console compatibility that you get with Fanatec and their wider ecosystem. They do have a much larger selection of rims available and whatnot. Although, as I mentioned earlier, there are other peripherals maybe aren't at the same quality level that Simagic is at this point in time. So we'll see what Fanatec does in the future. I'm sure that they must be coming out with a new handbrake and a new shifter and maybe even some new pedals pretty soon. I don't have any insider information there. Don't read too much into that, but I would be amazed if they didn't announce something, hopefully sometime this year. Uh, they're well, well, well overdue for both of those things. So finally, let's do a quick comparison with, uh, with Simucube here as well. Now, remembering that Simucube is significantly more expensive across all three levels. Remember also that uh, the Mini kind of sits outside their ecosystem. It is quite a lot lower in terms of uh, its strength. So the, the Sport is more of a comparison to the Alpha. The, uh, the U is kind of somewhere in between the Pro and the Ultimate, and then the Ultimate kind of sits even higher again. So look, what I would say there is that overall, the, the experience with the SimiQ bases is that little bit more refined, Similar to what we were talking about with the Acer Tech bases before, very, very smooth force feedback. Similar kind of smoothness overall in terms of feeling the weight of the car, the, the, the communication of the suspension and the contact patch of the road. SimiCube and more recently Acer Tech have always been my benchmark in terms of feeling those aspects that are fundamentally important to feeling connected to the car and being able to drive quickly and consistently. And I would say that that is almost at the same level with these Sim Magic bases, a negligible difference. And I would say, you know, better value for money in the Sim Magic ecosystem with regards to that. Where I think that Acer Tech and SimiCube 2 sits a little bit higher is just in that really granular detail. Things like textures in the road, ripple strips, uh, grass surfaces and whatnot, just have that little bit more detail on, uh, on the SimiQ2 bases than they do here. And trying to dial that in across these three bases does result in a little bit more a grainy feel, a little bit more robotic feel 
uh, and just not quite as refined as what you get on those semi cube bases. And I don't know whether it's just simply down to the motors that they're using here. Remembering again, the price point is a lot lower. Maybe there are some sacrifices there. I tend to lean towards it being more a, uh, a firmware based thing though, which is good news because it means that ultimately, hopefully they would be able to, you know, bring these up to the level of the semi cube bases. But I just don't know, that's, that's a guess, but I feel like Overall, the semi cubes are a slightly more refined product. Again, we are talking very, very fine tolerances here. And you are, of course, paying a lot more for that privilege. Whether or not it's gonna be worth it to you is gonna be a very subjective thing. For me, having experienced all these wheelbases, I can honestly tell you that, you know, having, having experienced something like a semi cube 2 Pro and Ultimate, you know, having felt that detail, that, you know, that real authenticity that you get through those bases and the Acetec Invicta as well, it would be hard for me to go back to something like this having experienced that. And I would probably, you know, in the back of my mind, I'd always be thinking, oh, if only, if only, if only. But, you know, you are spending a lot more money for that, for that tiny little, you know, it's, we're talking the last few percent here. So I think really where, I, where it, what it comes down to for me is, you know, if you're stepping up from something like, you know, a Logitech G923 or a CSL DD, you know, a much more entry level base than what we're talking about here, you're gonna be absolutely blown away by the experience with any of these guys. You're gonna be absolutely happy with it and you're probably, you know, not gonna feel compelled as I was saying before. I think that, you know, the Alpha would probably be a forever base for a lot of people. If money just isn't an object for you, then I would be lying if I didn't say that there is that little bit more to be had in some of those more expensive bases, but it is a really, really fine margin that we're talking about here. And look, at the end of the day, I think they've done a really good job with all three of these products. I think that they absolutely nail what they need to at the price point. I'm hopeful that they will be able to refine that force feedback a little bit further into the future but you know just looking at how far they've come since we originally reviewed the m10 many years ago now and even just in the last six months that we've been getting back in and testing these products again they've, they've fixed a lot of the bugs that we experienced previously and uh, they clearly care a lot about the community and uh, you know are really passionate about what they're doing which is really great to see so yeah where i sit on this one is i think that these are all fantastic value for money i think you're absolutely getting what you pay for and then some and uh, yeah absolutely no reason not to recommend any of these products to uh, to anybody that's looking at buying into an ecosystem for the first time. So we will of course be unpacking this even further once we have full force working on those uh, CSDD and DD plus bases. We also do, as I mentioned earlier, have the SimiCube 2 Sport Pro and the Ultimate Base that I've had on my rig for quite some time now. So we are gonna be revisiting those again in the next couple of months and uh, talking about the experience of those in more detail and how they compare across to others as well. So yeah, guys, I really hope that today's video has helped you out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on those future videos. Make sure you do check out those detailed reviews of some of the other products that we've referenced in today's video as well. That will give you the best overall picture of what's going to suit your needs and budget best. And remember again as well, we do have some discount codes as well as affiliate links down in the description box below. So if you do decide you want to pick up any of the gear that we've talked about in today's video, whether it's SimMagic, SimiCube or any of the other brands, that is an awesome way of helping support our work at no additional cost. And we really do appreciate your support there. But above all, thank you very much for watching guys. And I will see you again in the next one. Bye.